So why is your company looking to achieve a net zero goal? What are the benefits and why is this really important? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you, Ursula. Um, well, if, if we go back to 2019, um, Ball announced its science-based targets, um, targets by 2030, to reduce scope one and two greenhouse gas by 55% and scope three by 16%. And earlier this year, we took that one step further to say that our global sustainability goals would now include our ambition to achieve net zero before 2050. Um, mm -hmm. And for us, a big part of achieving that is about 90% collection rates on used beverage cans and 85% re recycled contents in, in those places or those geographies we operate in. And for us, it's an important goal because we're not only striving to do the right thing by the environment, you know, and, and each of us as uh, people beyond being employees, but to improve Ball's performance and to help our customers reach their emissions targets. Because if we're not helping our customers do that, um, frankly, we're, we're missing a step. We're missing the full impact of what we could be doing. So perhaps could you give us a few examples about the positive actions that your company is taking to really drive uh, the change needed to make net zero a reality. Absolutely. Uh, in Europe, we've already achieved 100% renewable electricity. Uh, this is centered around two VPPAs, so virtual power purchase agreements. And in addition to that, all 23 of our plants are ASI certified for performance and chain of custody. And so ASI um, is very specific to the aluminum industry and it's a multi-stakeholder initiative that provides assurance that we've responsibly you know, produced, sourced, um, and, and followed our aluminum throughout the full value chain, which is you know, the full value chain uh, operations are where we get the most impact, but they're the hardest to, to handle. You know, it, aside from those two specific examples, the biggest opportunity we have uh, to reduce our carbon footprint is through increased recycling rates. Um, and so when we think about how we're working on that in particular, we're part of every can counts program across Europe to engage and support consumers to recycle. Uh, we provide thought leadership to develop and implement modern collection systems to make sure that we're collecting all these beverage cans that we can um, and really collaborating with all of the stakeholders to make sure that we, we get what we need. Um, so perhaps we could talk about some of the challenges that you've also faced. Um, what do you think is the most significant hurdle that you've had when it comes to achieving net zero? How have you been able to overcome this? Yeah, I think it's important to point out that at Ball, we're still very much in the beginning of our journey to achieve net zero. Um, and we believe it'll only be possible when we work in collaboration with our full supply chain, uh, which I mentioned earlier. You know, our, our most ambitious goal and commitment is to achieve 90% recycling rates. And that means relying on policymakers, waste management sector, our suppliers and our customers all working together through the full supply chain. And ultimately, we want to end in a place of real circularity, which involves that continuous recovery and reuse of material. So nothing is lost in the process. But in order to do this, it means packaging not only needs to be collected and easily mm -hmm. sorted, but every part of it needs to be separated out and fully recycled with no loss to become a product of the same value. And while it's easy to say that to you in this interview, um, it touches so many people and systems and process and only through that collaboration um, can we get to the right, to the right place really. Um, what is the main learning you would share with a company at the beginning of their net zero journey? Yeah, for, for us at Ball, 
it's it's really been about measuring our current emissions because you can't manage what you can't measure, which is what we also often say about um, our plants and manufacturing, et cetera. But it's also very, very true um, and relevant to our impact on the environment as well. Um, and then the second thing is just around balance. Uh, it's good to set ambitious targets. But they have to be validated and based in reality. And so for us, that meant using the science-based target initiative to, to mm -hmm. be that third party to make sure we were grounded in, in reality. Um, so the next question is a bit about the supply chain. Um, I know you've talked about it before a little bit, but perhaps I don't know if you'd like to talk a bit more concretely about how you are engaging with your supply chain and cross sector more broadly to drive the net zero transition across the economy and achieve the systemic change you were talking about. The, need, the fact that this touches on so many aspects of what your, com of what your company does and who it talks to and who it works with. Absolutely. So at Ball, we like to talk about this full supply chain engagement as our vision for circularity. Um, and it's really uh, our, our signal to the industry that joint efforts and working together are the way that we're going to get the best results. And working together, these joint efforts include boosting the scaling of aluminum collection, sorting, and recycling infrastructure, executing innovative campaigns and activations to educate consumers about you know, the infinite recyclability of aluminum as a material, mm -hmm. aligning the industry on extended producer responsibility and deposit return system policies, you know, building an ambitious global recycling gold recycling roadmap that delivers mm -hmm. a carbon pathway aligned with the industry's net zero um, and one and a half degrees targets. Um, it, it goes all the way into proactively advocating for recycling policies that deliver greater than 90% can global real recycling rates and making sure that we get to that 85% global recycled content in the aluminum used for our beverage cans. So we are talking uh, on the Monday after COP26, um, which has been a significant global milestone. Could you tell me a bit about what your reflections are um, at this stage? Any kind of key points that you are thinking about at Ball and, and that will influence how you progress in the next period? Yeah, I think there were a couple things that uh, I took away. And, you know, in order to achieve the Paris Agreement, it's important that all sectors of the global economy have to decarbonize, even the hard to abate ones. Um, which is now we're starting to hear more people talk about the shipping industry and, and some of those pieces that are the more challenging ones to go after, um, which I really appreciate, right? We can't ignore those mm -hmm. because that's where a chunk of the issue is. The energy industry is already well underway to be decarbonized, but we saw a mm -hmm. new push for uh, land regeneration, which I thought was great. Uh, and alongside that, uh, nature being used as a key lever for a solution um, and commitments are now being made to protect and restore natural environments and, and seeing, you know, more than 100 countries pledged to reverse deforestation by 2030 uh, was just fantastic to see. I, I think one thing that was a bit disappointing was the last minute change from phase out to phase down um, mm -hmm. when it comes to fossil fuels. Speaking a bit more about the, the specific policy areas that um, should also respond to the international policy, um, when it comes to European climate policy and the Fit for 55 package, could you tell us a bit about your view on the Fit for 55 package? What are your priorities uh, as a company uh, that you'd like to see coming out from this package? Yeah, no, great, great question, because achieving these emissions reductions in the next decade is really how we would make Europe become the world's first climate neutral continent by 2050 um, and make the European Green Deal a reality. 
you know, as we talked about before, we already achieved 100% renewable electricity in Europe. And for our newly announced facilities, we're bringing in state-of-the-art equipment, exploring opportunities to further reduce our energy consumption, um, and, and even looking at the opportunity for on-site energy generation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that's of particular interest to our industry is CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. Mm -hmm. um, we're monitoring that really closely with our suppliers to ensure that what's being proposed is actually going to do the right thing and doesn't contribute to carbon leakage, um, which would not uh, which would not put us into the right direction. So, anyway, those are some key items that uh, that I find interesting and, and impact our industry directly. So, from a what are your views on the on the net zero strategy that the government has come come forward with? What are you what are your priorities for that strategy? Yeah, I think you know it's critical that we see investment in the enablers to achieve the strategy rather than just say that there is a strategy. Um, that means investment in technology, innovation, capital mobilization, behavior change, engagement. Um, we already have that clear target uh, in, in 2050 from the government, net zero across the economy. But the strategy also needs to include clarity on the steps in between. So 2030, 2035, 2040, and give clarity on the roles of national, local, and regional actors so that everyone's moving along and we don't find ourselves halfway there and not having made the progress that's needed. Um, and, and from our point of view for, for packaging, we're expecting the government to announce the introduction of a deposit return system for glass, PET, and cans. Uh, this will increase dramatically the recycling rates of all beverage packaging, including cans, which by the way are already at 82% in the UK, uh, enabling us to increase can-to-can -can recycling, are really fulfilling that true circularity vision uh, that we have for our industry.